So I'll, we'll start with um, Hamza, Hamzavani's talk, and then this will be shortly followed, subsequently followed straight after by Dina's talk. Thank you. Okay, right, thank you, you Ashok. Um, so um, today I think I'm going to talk about um, decolonization and queens um, in relation to that. So I think just to set a bit of context, um, when we talk about decolonization, what do we mean? Um, and so by definition, decolonization means undoing colonization. Um, and so while it feels like colonization might be over, um, unfortunately it's nowhere near over. So um, we do we do talk about um, colonization in a global sense where the British Empire may not may no longer formally exist, but it is approximately 500 years of cultural, political and material influences um, um, on the world still remain. And this has shaped the way our societies look um, and also explains why social inequalities exist in the way they do. Um, and so at its core to me, decolonization is really about understanding modern day racism in a historical context um, and understanding how the material realities, um, so our governments and uh, economies, for example, um, are structured as well as the cultural and social processes um, of colonialism, how they manifest in our world today. So it's about understanding the history of the empire and how its legacy has shaped the world we live in. Um, and so today's seminar is obviously about decolonizing history. Um, and, and so when we talk about decolonization, we are talking about looking at, at histories and how they've been written. Um, universities are, are really, really crucial in the conversation around decolonization um, because the Western university has played a crucial role in maintaining the status quo um, and historically, university um, has been a key site where colonial knowledge has been produced, um, disseminated, as well as normalized around the world. Um, and so the work of decolonization really comes in to UK universities in 2015, when student-led campaigns like Why Is My Curriculum White um, and Roads Must Fall Oxford um, started to connect the rich history of student radical, uh, radicalism with uh, decolonization. Um, I can't talk about decolonizing um, campaigns without talking about the Roads Must Fall campaign. I'm not going to go too much into it today, but um, it was a campaign that started in the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and similarly, uh, the Statue of Cecil Rhodes um, in Oxford uh, which um, you'd have seen in the news recently um, over the cause of the Black Lives Matter protest that Oxford has pledged to remove the statue. Um, and so moving forward from student-led campaigns on these issues, um, decolonization has become a national conversation across the higher education sector. Um, and despite this, we still see um, you know, the need for this to be a grassroots conversation um, because universities do play a role in relation to inequality. Um, and, and I think it's really important for us to also understand that when we talk about, in this context, decolonizing history, um, I am no historian um, and don't claim to be. <laughs> so um, when we talk about decolonizing history, I think it's important for us to also really question what we're talking about when we talk about decolonizing. And so when we say decolonizing the curriculum, um, we're looking at our shared assumptions about how the world is and how it's accepted in many disciplines, um, but especially history, that the past and especially assumptions of uh, regarding racial and civilizational hierarchy informed a lot of thinking about how the world worked, uh, what was worth studying in it, and how it should be studied. Um, and those assumptions also informed and justified the expansion of colonial rule 
um, in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East until the mid 20th century. Um, and so decolonial work really um, talks about a way of thinking about the world which takes colonialism, uh, the empire, and racism as its um, empirical and discursive objects of study, um, as well as alternative ways of thinking about the world and alternative forms um, of political praxis. Um, so in terms of Queens and where that comes in, um, I think Ashok mentioned a little bit when he was introducing me. So when I came into Queens, um, I'm an international student and um, my involvement in decolonization campaigns kind of came in because of my involvement with the National Union of Students. Um, and these campaigns were going all across England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and I realized no one was talking about decolonization in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think conversations of race have been a bit conveniently far behind the rest of the UK uh, in Northern Ireland for some time. And so when I came into my role as vice president um, in the Students' Union two years ago, it was really um, a huge part of my work to to normalize this language, um, to engage with the student body and the staff body um, about this um, work and as well as um, uh, setting up a student and staff network called the Decolonize Network, um, in which we talked about what our visions of a decolonized university would look like and, and how the work should go forward and, um, as, as well as, I think, placing um, a lot of importance about the fact that this work should be grassroots led. Um, and, and this is because of the deep inequalities that still persist in education, but especially for students of color. Um, and while we know that nationally there are issues like the BAME attainment gap, um, in which BAME students are 20% less likely to achieve a first or upper second class degree, compared to their white counterparts, um, despite having been um, admitted into university with the same entry level grades. Uh, we don't have um, stats for this in specific to Queens. Um, and there's also quite a lack of sufficient research, especially in Northern Ireland, into issues resulting into things like the attainment gap um, and how it affects uh, BAME students, especially BAME students with intersectional identities, uh, which is what we find a lot in Queens, where a large proportion of our BAME students tend to be also international students. Um, but also it's important to look at how um, their intersectional identities, um, for example, um, BAME women or BAME LGBT class students or BAME disabled students. Um, and so there's there's not much research done um, in that in that sphere. And and so when I came into my role, it was quite important for me to start having those conversations. Um, and over two years, um, we've we've begun, I think, the process of not just normalizing the conversation, but also bringing this um, this language into boardrooms and and into conversations with senior management and. And there are steps being taken towards these questions. Um, I think in conversations with a lot of academics at Queen's, I know there's some brilliant work that's going on um, in different schools, in different faculties, um, but there is a wider question of how do we decolonize the university? And, and those are the real difficult questions. Um, I know today um, when I was thinking about decolonizing history and what I was going to talk about, um, obviously as someone who's not a historian, um, this was quite an interesting topic, I think, for me to put stuff together on. Um, but I think in terms of navigating the classroom, especially in terms of history, and speaking on this panel, um, I really have been questioning myself on to um, in terms of, you know, the fact that in Queens, I can't think of, of black historians um, and, and why are we not doing more um, in terms of um, our recruitment and why are we not doing more in terms of our engagement around these issues? Um, 
I could be mistaken, obviously. Um, but these are just questions that have been coming up in my mind as I've been thinking more about this. Um, as well as sitting here and having a conversation around decolonizing history as someone who isn't necessarily from a history background, but more of an activist background, um, I, I want to see more conversations around um, decolonizing specific um, topics and, and, and um, well, I guess also in schools, you know, it's important that these conversations happen within schools and, and engage across both student and staff bodies. Um, and in navigating the classroom, um, you know, in terms of decolonizing history, what are the assumptions about power, race and gender that are being made by the researchers, scholars or writers that we're using in our reading lists? Um, and, and what about the assumptions that um, are, are made by those researchers, scholars, writers? Um, how do how does that affect the questions uh, that we're asking um, or not asking in the classroom? Um, and also I think it's important to be asking what purpose does the research or text that's being used in the classroom serve? Um, and as well as who's funding it and why? Um, and the, the relationship as well as the power dynamic that exists between the researcher um, and their subject um, and I think it's important that there has to be a collective power um, within the cause or department um, in terms of working on decolonizing history, uh, you know, as a, as a school, as, as a faculty, whatever that work might look like. And when we're talking about decolonizing the curriculum or decolonizing a specific um, you know, study, it's important to th also be thinking critically about how the institution is structured because decolonizing history isn't just the answer to decolonizing queens. You know, we are a university that's, that's massive um, and decolonizing, um, you know, one, one specific area of study has to go hand in hand with thinking critically about how the structures of the institution and the power dynamics play out and how um, the way our universities run perpetuate social inequalities, um, as well as questioning um, if universities can be truly free of um, colonial structures as long as they continue um, you know, charging tuition fees or treating education um, as a commodity rather than a human right um, and a social good. Um, and, and, you know, our university is truly the environment that, you know, they, they see, seem to be in terms of, you know, a place of open-mindedness or liberation. But really, um, our universities that were, when they're investing um, money in companies and organizations that, pollute the environment or develop weapons and support oppressive regimes um, and so while we work on decolonizing our own areas of study it is important to question the structures that we exist within inside of a university and the structures that we exist within um, as a society um, what place does the university have in, in modern society today in relation to the historical positioning of the university um, that went hand in hand with colonization. Um, it's also important, I think, for us to realize that um, it's decolonizing, not diversifying. Um, I think with a lot of the increasing media attention, um, both because of Black Lives Matter movements, um, but also because decolonization has become um, the buzzword of the HE sector, um, I think it's it's really really important that we we recognize the difference between decolonizing and diversifying. And decolonizing your curriculum isn't simply about adding more black and brown faces to your reading lists. Um, and this is really about in, interrogating the very concepts 
that we are taught who teaches them to us and why. Um, texts written by people of color may still re reproduce racist ideas. Um, and so when undertaking decolonizing work, it's important for us to ask the tough questions. Um, and, you know, we've seen this work done across the country. It's, it's not, um, you know, a short-term thing. Um, this, it, it is really a long-term process. We're not going to be able to decolonize the entire study of history um, in one day. And, and to be honest, is it really truly possible but it is the simple, small steps that we take every day uh, within our classrooms and the conversations that we're having, you know. Um, and, and learning about decolonization can be difficult. A lot of the material on the subject is quite heavy. Um, but it is important, I think, um, both um, for educators and learners to, to be aware of, of the histories and the context um, of your areas of study as well as um, in terms of working within a university space to remember that, you know, education needs to encourage the development of radical, imaginative and transformative knowledge that can truly change the world. Um, yeah, so I'm going to wrap up with that. Thank you. Uh, Dina, uh, that was very. That was a very interesting talk, uh, Hamza. Um, so uh, and gave gave us a lot of food to talk. Uh, sorry, l l to um, discuss afterwards. Um, so, but we'll first go to Dina first, and then afterwards we'll take questions. Uh, uh, questions will be fielded to both of you. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Dina go now. Uh, thanks so much, Ashok and Hamza. Um, can you see an image on your screen? Just want to double check. Yes, we can. Thank yes. you so much. Thanks. OK, so hi, I'm Dina. Um, thank you so much. Um, and um, I hope that colleagues, friends and members of the public find my contribution of interest. Uh, this offering arises after the last five years. Um, Hamza spoke about two years here at, at Queen's, but at least the last five years of what has become quite a well-known phrase to decolonize the curriculum, where there have been a plethora actually of papers, books, sometimes toolkits, tick boxes here in the UK, and also in my country of South Africa. But it's a term taken, as Hamza was saying, from what is really, and of course you would know in history, the much longer period and projects of decolonization. Um, so I'll be using this time to deliberate what I see as really the impossibility of what I was asked to speak about. Decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing the disciplines, and the more substratal decolonizing the university. I make three strong assertions in this brief talk to problematize the task that I see ahead of you. The first is that decolonization is not a metaphor. The second is that decoloniality is an ideal. And the third is that decolonizing the curriculum is impossible. Bear with me as I unpack these in a messy way, drawing from a range of arguments and insights with the hope that what I'm doing is trying to help you raise questions. I feel that none of what Hamza and I offer you in this talk will lead to much that is of significance if you don't firstly engage with context. What is the colonial legacy of Northern Ireland? How was the land, peoples, languages, belief systems, and ways of being subjugated, delegitimized, erased? How were they displaced? And what was the agency of those who were made to leave and those who remained? How does undermining continue? Where were they resisted? Where have they persisted? I do wonder sometimes here if some of the resistance to even saying the word decolonize, when you talk about decolonize the curriculum, comes from the difficulty of tackling this beast. 
However, you would need to do that. You'd need to go into the difficult terrain if you're honest about this interest in decolonizing. And you would also need to be careful not to fall back into a habit that I've noted here, that of exoticizing the ugliness of the other or asking the other to do this painful work, supposedly to find generalizability with the beast in your midst. That may sound unfair, perhaps, but I really tussled with being here in the correspondence, the organizer would know this, being part of this panel, because I've noticed this phenomenon before. But in the spirit of hope that it is one of the first of many internal conversations to follow and that you'll wrestle with this Northern Ireland context, I continue in good faith. So I'm here as a scholar in critical higher education studies and as a South African. And I'd like to briefly talk about the engagement on decolonization and decolonizing of the curriculum in my country. From, um, from 1994, after our negotiated political settlement from apartheid rule, we moved from discourses of conflict, which you really just don't hear now, to crisis development, and then sort of forward looking to transformation as a rainbow nation of plurality. There was a period, I guess, of relief or historical amnesia, depending on which sort of side you're looking at that, which slowly re led to a reckoning with the persistence of apartheid in our midst, in our institutions, our social relations, our social interactions and formations. But dismantling racism led in genealogies from apartheid to colonialism. Racism is interwoven with colonialism because it's its enabling fiction. But of course, racism is not just skin or constructions based on skin. Um, I saw a disconcerting BBC Kids program during the recent Black Lives Matter um, pro movement protest. And, and the presenters in that kids program were asserting that they can't help being born with a different skin. It's not their fault as if there was some sort of deficit in being black. The issue, of course, is more than skin. It is about power relations over different ways of being, knowledges, authorities, and authorship. It's about ways of negotiating time and space, about self, other relations, sure, but also community that's often not about the egolatry of the West. And it's it's about the material, it's about land, its fruits and raw materials, about diamonds, gold, oil, labor, land and its interwovenness with how we move and how we live on it, how we engage with it and with non-human animals, about how we speak with the land, and then also the effects of taking people from it, displacing them from it, creating systems of entitlement and ownership over land, enslavement of those people, which have, persists, of course, in various forms today, not least in migration. Decolonization is disruptive, it's hard, and I'm told by a Cornish decolonial scholar, a really long road in UK soil. Decolonialization and decoloniality strive to be just. Equality does not offer that. Diversity does not offer that. Inclusion is a kick in the face. As historians, you would know that you have to know about colonialism. External colonialism is extractive. Internal colonialism is oppression. Settler colonialism as the obliteration or enslavement in the interests of the settler, mental colonialization as the internalized violence that perpetuates colonialism by the colonized. Universities of the Euro-American empires have colluded with churches, with kings and queens, merchants, military, with Cold War antics. They've caused institutionalized plunder racism and ignorance, and in curation, they, we, actively erased and re-offered history, offered that, that narrow archive as the canon, 
and we continue to reproduce and gatekeep what is knowledge as universal. I really like writing canon as canon with two ends. Now, is the university going to be the solution? The space where the gates were created and the gates are closed. Coloniality is the continuation of undermining the indigenous and the geopolitics of the settler university and the international university continue to do that. It's the mess of prog progress. Walter Benjamin spoke so beautifully when he said that there is no document of civilization that is not a document of barbarism. But in the latter, he revealed how locked he too was in colonial logics. So can we create cracks and fissures? Or will this just be another added fad in the narrative of the Euro-American university? Such disingenuous engagement is salt in the wound. Because coloniality and decolonization is not new. So first, look at it critically. At it and yourselves. How is decolonizing the curriculum operating in changing the university, the emancipation of adults, land, relations through our representations and memories of it? Why is it so popular now? Is it solidarity, guilt, the pleasures of raging, white savior stuff, a way to get another award or university rankings or to please the student market? In this time of inequality and global capital, will our fiddling change the world? Will it be more than navel gazing about white privilege and reflexivity and become a concerted effort against the machinations of domination of whiteness and Euro-American normativity? And then who is to do this work? The ones who endured colonialism? The descendants who point to the politics of belonging, like BME students are doing now, and the costs and of inclusion. An example, this website was created to counter erasure. I was at its launch and I heard such gratitude expressed by the so-called mixed race Irish people who were in the audience for the recognition it gave them of time, of not being fresh migrants. It's a counter narrative to refer to when they claim that they legitimately belong here. But even this website centers Britishness and empire. Where are any of the many countries in Africa where the Irish and British played a role in coloniality? I was educated by Irish dance. Many of us were. They came back to Belfast and established your development education tradition. Where is that memory? Where are the traces of love, solidarity, complexity and kinship with the various peoples that your Irish settlers grew to live alongside and now have descendants enmeshed in colonial relations? That Irish women were taken from your workhouses and sent for German legionnaires coupling in the area of the Eastern Cape of South Africa, that Irish men fought against the British in the South African wars, the possibility that priests with suspicions of paedophilia were sent to Africa. Is that truly your interest? To know the full histories, to seek the gaps, to recognize your disciplined compl complicity in amnesia and ignorance? But even then, Conscientization, social justice, these are not decolonization. They are beautiful projects and they're ones that I am deeply committed to, but they are not decolonization. So we need to be careful because decolonizing, decolonizing and decolonization is not a metaphor and decolonizing the curriculum is a metaphor. I included the strong paper. Many of you may know it. If, if you don't, it's a really good starting point. It's by Tuck and Yang. The quote begins by asserting that their goal, and I'll, I'll read some bits for you, is to remind readers 
what is unsettling about decolonization. Decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. I'll leave the rest for you to read later, but I, I want to highlight the last part, which I have in bold. They write, the metaphorization of decolonization makes possible a set of evasions or settler moves to innocence that problematically attempt to reconcile settler guilt and complicity and risk, rescue settler futurity. What is this institution's history with settler colonialism? If a university is a space of knowledge production, evidence gathering, commemoration, heritage, and imagination, where is its institutional history? Where are its archives of Ireland as a colony? A friend of mine living in Dublin said that when her treatment as a black person on this island gets bad, she reminds herself, I think really gracefully, it was the first to be colonized. It'll take the longest to uncoil itself. So how to do this? I really don't know, but I do applaud your attempt to try. If we are to engage in decolonial critiques in the academy, how do they substantially differ from other projects? Stain and De Silva asserts that how they differ is, and I'm going to read a bit here, they refuse the notion that the primary violence of colonialization is the exclusion of certain populations and communities from the supposedly universal promises offered by modern institutions. And that's because to name exclusion as the primary violence of the system is to, and before I continue, I just want you to think about this and think about the myth of social mobility. To name exclusion as the primary violence of the system is to firstly invalidate other ways of knowing and being by assuming that everyone desires access to the same promised future, futures and direction of social change. And the second one is that it invisibilizes the fact that modern institutions do not simply exclude other populations, but rather are made possible at the expense of violence against these populations. I wonder if this is partly why students have led this call in the UK and why it is why it is the descendants of the people of so-called post-colonial spaces who live here who are saying this is not the purpose of higher education to further reproduce this dominant hegemonic knowledges of empire. It is possible that they are rightfully rejecting the debt of gratitude for inclusion and are asking for democratic participation in knowledge co-creation. The call for changes in power and for student voice that have been around in Western Europe, particularly since the 60s, 1968. It's absolutely important, but it should not collapse into decolonization or, de or collapse decolonization. And what does this mean in Northern Ireland and the UK where we are situated and benefit so I guess the question is, can history studies be a site for the realization of epistemic and cognitive justice of decoloniality? And what are the conditions for its possibility? Only you can do this work. But in my sphere of critical university studies, what many of us have found is that it requires loss, humility, generosity, and grace to recognize that to the structural relations, but also not to bind one's responsibility, nor to bind those who we are pitted against by those subjectivities of histories and to try to push forward to a different aesthetic. In my own small way, I've tried holding institutions to account for decolonization rhetoric. In South Africa, we're at the point where we're talking about decolonizing decolonization. And I've used the dispassionate tools of the neoliberal academy to do so somewhat ineffectively. I've also been looking at unfunded ways into to 
unfunded ways in which to curate counter narratives. On the right, there's a wall of artworks, films, plays, stories that others have made. And on the left, a project of artworks of first generation academics counter stories from South Africa, Zimbabwe, Syria and India, whose ways of being offer critical hope. I wrestle constantly, as do others, with not decolonization as a metaphor, but the conditions of its possibility. And so to end, I'd like to assert that decolonization is about dismantling colonial structures and individuals and groups and that which undoes indigenous ways of being, knowing and the material through the undermining, misrecognition, erasure, delegitimation in the past and in the present. Decolonization is about identifying, strengthening, celebrating the resistances, the alternatives, the agency that has been there at various times and in the present, not in some sort of deficit way and not in an exotic romantic projection, nor while doing so, so ignoring the material and the structural dismantling that needs to happen. Decolonization is about finding ways through, even when we cannot yet imagine it, it's possibly culturally sustaining practices, interrelations and knowledges. Trying to find ways through when our logics now cannot foresee it or trust or believe it credible. When it is impossible, that is when we have the ethical obligation to seek to decolonize. And of course, to engage with power, loss, reparations, humility, the land, and our ancestors. Thank you, Dina, for uh, a very thoughtful and provocative talk that will um, um, hopefully we'll have a chance, we'll have five minutes to, you know, for people to think and take a pause and then to ask you questions, so. Okay, shall I ask the first question then if nobody else wants to um, uh, talk? Okay, my question would be both for both of you, I mean, something that's come across in, uh, in, in both your talks, if I'm correct in thinking, is the particular difficulties in Northern Ireland of approaching this issue um, and um, you know of decolonization and i wonder and if the, the the difficulty you see is actually first approaching those topics about colonization within northern ireland which is a very sensitive topic across both both you know political divides and how you see that is hindering you know you know a broader discussion about decolonization or race uh, uh, within uh, um, Northern Ireland and sometimes limiting it in a way because for instance when I for instance talk about India or um, the partitioning of India for instance it's always viewed initial kind of way to get students interested to view it through some sort of parallels with sectarianism in Northern Ireland and whether that is delimiting or uh, or what kind of particular difficulties in the delays that you see in talking about these issues in Northern Ireland compared to Hamza, you said in Scotland or England, you, see, you noted less resistance or a more political engagement with these issues earlier on. And why is it so delayed here? So I, I'd ask it if anybody wants to speak first, unmute your um, microphone and then yeah, talk. Um, I think Hamza should start partly because she's been here longer than me. Um, so Hamza, would you like to go for it? Um, okay, I'm gonna caveat this once again, um, as uh, I don't come from a perspective of um, an academic, um, just someone who's done the work um, past couple of years. Um, yeah, I, I've faced a lot of resistance in, in conversations, even, within the student body um, 
because I, I think Ashoki pointed it out, it is a sensitive topic when you're trying to talk about colonization um, in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think something that I always relate to is um, I find this especially in conversations around racism and obviously decolonial work is hand in hand with anti-racist work. Um, when we're talking about conversations around race in Northern Ireland, um, I find that a lot of people um, uh, find it easy to almost co-opt the conversation with conversations around sectarianism. And while, you know, there is a small minority uh, uh, of that um, comes from almost an innocent place of trying to understand issues of race uh, from a place of, you know, okay, we've experienced sectarianism um, and, and, and trying to relate that experience with racism. Um, often the, you're on this very fine line of, of, of using a different type um, of issue to try and relate with experiences, but rather than co-opting it um, within your own context. And I think what happens is um, so much of the conversations around any uh, liberation issue or social justice issue in Northern Ireland tends to be tried to forced, so kind of forced into this green and orange divide um, that, that we lose focus off the conversation entirely, that we lose focus of the topic entirely. And I think, you know, at, when I first started conversations around decolonization um, as a student, I, I also really struggled to kind of grasp how to handle this. Um, but every time I tried to handle a conversation where, you know, someone would get offended by the word decolonization, for example, or someone else would, would take it to mean something else, or, and then, you know, it would be this green and orange conversation once again, I then realized that we do need to, um, I think, almost steer the conversation back to what decolonization is and in the specific context that we're talking about. I think in Dina's presentation, though, she, she did highlight quite a few things to me that were quite interesting um, and, and maybe in her answer to this question, um, we'll have that, that perspective, but I think for me, it's important for us not to make it about tribal politics again. Um, and to stress that when, and especially when people of color, um, and black people are talking about decolonization, are talking about racial justice, um, and are talking about these things, especially within a university context, especially within spaces that are familiar to us, it's important that we try and engage and listen without co-opting that um, to try and fit that into the box of the green and orange divide that's so comfortable almost here. And, and that's, again, what I really stress in these conversations is if you feel discomfort, it is, it is, a, it is what's intended. Um, and so don't try to put it back into this green and orange divide that feels comfortable because all the conversations here fit into that. Um, sit in that discomfort and, and interrogate why you feel this, um, this discomfort, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been here for three years only and I'm, so I cannot really comment on why the response is the way it is. Um, my sense is, and this is what different people tell me about a number of things, is that if there seems to be a, a, an almost, um, that there's so many competing narratives and possibly the conditions are, or people have been conditioned, that unless it is a strong narrative that, that itself talks of sort of a successful outcome where uh, where one can excel in it or one can appropriate it and and make it a part of your thing or um, or there has to be a lot of people or whatever which in itself actually is is really counter what decolonization is so if it is 
if it is something small and and has and and has meaning that that is not that you know somehow so the sense of that there are so many competing narratives why not then associate it with something else that will catch the imagination um and this applies to a number of things but it seems particularly if it's a minoritized issue then um the the sort of green and orange thing might actually make it something that helps to get people involved or whatever. So you end up having to sell narratives or sell ideas, which I don't quite un I don't quite understand. Um, I mean, I do think that universities generally are battling with the decolonizing the curriculum idea um, all over the world. That it is almost impossible. Well, that's what I've tried to highlight is that it's almost impossible. Um, but just to give you a sense, I mean, in South Africa, it students led it and it was it was very very violent and it's it's not over um, by any means and universities were quite quick some of them to appropriate it and put them in their slogans you will see on some slogans of South African universities we are decolonized with an exclamation mark um, and in the process they they collapsed that that process so so I came from that where it was so all over the place that people were literally saying, but what is this? What, you know, and it's very interwoven with Africanization and with people are trying to figure out how to pull that apart. But but here there is either a strong sense of it, it has to, this is what I'm just giving an impression of, that it either has to be what's happening in England. So it's what happened at Oxford. That's what decolonizing the curriculum is, which is this weird sort of appropriation from the UK I mean, from England, which is worrying if you're talking about decolonizing, because it might just become another part of that process, or a complete resistance. Um, but it's very difficult to engage actually with that, which is your dismantling. Um, so I don't know. OK, can we take two questions now um, in succession um, from uh, Leone? who will ask a question first, if that's okay, Leone, and Donald shortly after, and then can you can feel you can feel those two questions. Uh, is that okay with you? Or do you want one? But yeah, okay. So Leone, Leone, could you? Sure. Ask? Yeah. Hi, Hamza. Hi, Dina. Um, thanks so much for your um, talks. That's um, really, they both, they've massively improved my week. Um, and I just wanted to, I suppose, um, I suppose I have a rather parochial question about um, after all the idea, incredible ideas that you've um, given us, rather parochial question about like how you make any change in, in an institution like Queen's. Um, I suppose um, what, I, what I feel and things that you've said as well is that on the one hand you can do certain kinds of things um, and they're kind of co-opted in one way or another or turned into something else perhaps and, and then in other areas you end up just a sort of sucked into the vortex of of institutional structures and regimes that um uh, sort of feel like an inexorable force and and i completely agree that all everything must come from the grassroots and that this is a struggle but i i sort of wonder if you have any thoughts on on how you make any change happen and <laughs> um, besides perhaps in the little realm that you might have with your own in your own classroom thanks uh, Donald, uh, can you ask your question as well? Yeah, that's all right. Thanks. I don't know if you can see me. Can you? Yeah. OK, thanks very much. That was uh, was really interesting to hear about your experience and kind of your your knowledge of these areas. And, and like the last speaker, this is exactly what I needed on a Friday evening after a hellish week of preparation for campus teaching that will not be taking place. We've just found out. Um, so I just wanted to to ask about um, another kind of interrelated debate, which is not exactly what you're talking about, but but which is to do with public heritage. And uh, so I've just started a project um, here in in the Republic about the decolonization of public heritage, and um, a lot of what you were saying really struck a chord with me, particularly about these kind of moves to innocence by by institutions where you know returning an, an object can be seen as a, a move to, towards decolonization. Um, and I just think, I just wanted to know what you thought about how, how these kind of processes might 
um, unfold in an, in an Irish context. And I'm particularly interested by the fact that, you know, in my discussions with curators, um, so I previously worked in Bristol where there was, you know, a very different context around questions of decolonization. This is before Colston um, fell. You know, everything was kind of articulated in a kind of a conflictual um, language, which I think was really important. But here the language is very much one of, oh yes, that makes sense. We understand that from, from an Irish perspective. And in a way that that's really positive. So we we probably will have some acts of restitution upcoming. But it also means that um, there's kind of a sense that, okay, so the, the logic of colonial booty, you know, doesn't apply to Ireland because Ireland wasn't a colonizer. So thus these debates are kind of almost moot in Ireland. Uh, and the kind of things that you were both talking about, how decolonizing is connected to racial justice and connected to understanding Ireland's um, kind of enmeshment in networks of empire has been overlooked. So I was wondering if you could maybe comment on that. I know it's kind of different, both in terms of it being about public heritage and in terms of the South, but I'd be really interested in hearing your opinions. Thanks. You, you're muted. You you guys are muted. Can you unmute you? Uh, unmute no, no, you? we're not muted. We're we're being polite and saying who's going to go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Hamza, I will. I'll not be cheeky. I'll, I'll go first with this. Um, Leonie, the question of how to change a university, whether it's got to do with de decolonizing the university, which is really the impossible one because universities are instruments of colonialism. Um, that is, I mean, that's my area of study. And um, the the reason why I work at Nelson Mandela University is that they have this fantastic chair there. And the, the subject of it is the critical study of the transformation of higher education. Um, because um, those of us who have studied it have found it persistently resistant to, it changes all the time. I mean, it's plastic, the university. That's what my lovely collaborator Andre Kiert talks about is the plastic university, how it changes and morphs in response. But when it comes to justice, wow, it's really difficult to change it towards justice. Um, so there are a number of different ideas around this. And I know that you're, you, you often come back when, when I talk and you're like, okay, so what can we do? And it is important to go to what can we do? But actually there's, I think what at least what I think Hamza and I are trying to do here, or at least I'm trying to do here, is to say, please first think and read, because this is not new, and you can see how this has operated in a number of places. Um, some of our colleagues in, in Canada, I'm thinking particularly of Sharon Stain, she talks about the end of the university world, that we need to prepare ourselves for such a degree of loss in the way that the university, the Euro-American university has operated. If it is going to be universities that allow for knowledges in other parts of the world, it needs to end in its current formation. This, that is how strong she's thinking. Um, many of us from other places will talk rather about the different imaginaries that are needed. But basically you have to be attacking how knowledge is created, so that's the disciplines, and that is the most persistently difficult one to, to attack. And of course then, our educational projects, our relations within the institution, the sort of meso curriculum of how it's formed and how institutions relate. So it's really, it is really complex, but one can't sort of jump to how until you've really like grappled with thinking about what is it um, and how's it gonna operate? You know, Hamza, I don't know if you want to come in for that one and then we'll move on to the public history and curatorship one after. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of, I mean, can, can a university truly be decolonized? That's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, so I finished my role in the Students' Union in June. Um, and since then, um, I've been thinking a lot about what decolonization means um, outside the confines um, of a university and how decolonizing education continues outside those confines. Um, I do want to quickly reference uh, the Free Black University that was set up uh, recently by 
um, a group of fantastic uh, students and academics. Um, but the Free Black University Project was born entirely out of a desire for more um, because students have spent years campaigning for the decolonization of our universities, of our curriculums. And, and we find time and time again that uh, the response that institutions can offer are never going to be enough. Um, and that's really where it comes in. You, you cannot truly decolonize something that's built on colonization in itself. And the Western University was entirely built for that. And, and so is it fit for purpose when considering the decolonial agenda? Um, and I think while it's important to remember this, it's also important for us to continue the work that we're doing within our universities, within our disciplines and within the spaces that we exist in, because the university is an extremely traumatic space for um, black academics and uh, black students and, and, and um, academics of color and, and students of color. And it's these little pockets where we, we do move towards seeing some form of racial justice within the university uh, that allows us to survive within these spaces. Um, I know for sure that, um, you know, if I hadn't got involved in, in, in student activism and I hadn't met the, the academics that I met or, um, you know, that I, if I hadn't met, you know, some of the um, academics that I had teaching me who, who took that step to go out of the box and, and, and to change the way that we were learning, um, I would have I would have really, really, really found my time at university difficult because it is a hostile space and universities are built to be hostile um, to students of color. Um, and so and especially if you are a white academic, I really do um, urge you to think about the privilege that you have um, and and to think about the experiences of your students and especially of your students of color. Um, in navigating those hostile spaces uh, for the chance of an education. Um, and I think um, the last thing I wanted to say was, yes, while we exist within um, structures that were built to aid colonization itself, um, we have to, I think, in our own um, spaces, continue to confront the processes of the university and the structures of the university uh, that that enable it to continue um, maintaining the status quo. And those things are uh, marketization, corporatization, and securitization of education. Um, and, and so not only just thinking about our curriculums and our faculty diversity or hiring practices, but looking at the structures, looking at um, the internal democracy of the university, the manager, uh, managerialism, um, and and you know, really making sure that you know universities are not co-opting their diversity initiatives um, and incrementalist reformism into labeling it and, and labeling it as decolonization. Okay. I mean, I, sorry, um, Ashok. I just wanted to add. Um, so. Sometimes also what happens then is we, of course, get so bogged, bogged down by the structural that people sort of begin to think it's not possible, right? And without a doubt, one of, one of the most powerful currents is still the student movement. I mean, it is unbelievable. And in a way, the customer service thing that none of us quite believe in and doesn't really work the way it's meant to work, even if it was some sort of liberating the customer thing, actually can be used. Um, just to give you an example, in South Africa, the fees, the, the decolonizing the curriculum movement came along at the same time as the fees must fall movement because of the idea of higher education as a human right and, um, and the relationship that, that the ANC government had with the promise of education as freedom. And what had been decided by a government ministerial committee was impossible 
what had been pushed for by years by many academics um, and by universities VCs, which is free education for those who can't afford it, but have the academic ability to get in, right? was completely not possible. Students completely overturned that. And students mainstreamed the, the idea of decolonizing. So every single university has um, funding for um, uh, case studies of every single discipline and the way in which they're trying to decolonize, how it's not just about the reading list, how it's not just about the knowledges, how it's also about the engagements, how that's happening on your campus, culture and climate, all those sorts of things. That was absolutely from the student movement. My question is always, why should it be at the student's expense, if you know what I mean? If this has happened somewhere else and we know it's coming and we have agency as academics and supposedly academic freedom, then we should also be driving that. And giving up our agency, it's, it's really worrying because then we should be speaking much loudly about what that says about academic freedom then. Um. Um, we've got two more questions. We've got um, Sean and Niam. Um, can we have them again? Can we have two questions in succession? Sean, can you ask the first question? Niam, straight afterwards. Is, is that OK? Sasha, I'd like to thank both speakers. Really uh, stimulating and challenging papers in many ways. Um, many ways. In particular, I think um, Dina's kind of scepticism about why this event is being held in so asking us is this a, a one-off event that will go nowhere or is it part of a process that will be meaningful in some way I hope the answer is that it's the latter um, we've been having a, discussions um, over the over the summer in history um, about Black Lives Matters and our responses to that I guess so this feeds into today partially um, and I could talk about what history at Queen's has been doing, but I think that's um, pointless. You don't, you don't necessarily want to hear that. Um, but we have been trying a number of initiatives. Um, but I guess what I would like to ask you guys is where you think um, actions that we can take with as a, as a discipline within, a, within the School of HAP are kind of meaningful and where they become counterproductive can you think of examples or give us advice from your experience of where i mean we've been discussing all kinds of different activities and actions that would include for example asking every module convener to look at you know where they're thinking about race for example within or colonialism where it's appropriate within every module and asking everybody to include a, a week on that particular topic or a week that's related to that topic is that effective in your view is that counterproductive is it building something or is it can it be a counter counterproductive exercise i suppose and what i'm asking your advice on that as as somebody as part of the debate here within the, the team of historians about how we make small steps to maybe influence the next generation of, of scholars and uh, and move on Do, yeah. do you want to oh, yeah, ask your question as well? Yeah, sorry, I'll, 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 I'll do my question and then, um, yeah, let, let the panel respond. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for um, two really stimulating talks. Um, I think there's, there's so much for, for us to think about there um, and to, to unpack. Um, so thank you. Um, I guess one, obviously, as far as I've understood from the, the talks, I mean, there's, of course, the work that we'll have to do in terms of our curriculum and um, thinking about the sort of the forms of knowledge that are produced and that are, are sort of, I guess, reproduced through teaching in the university. That's one thing. But there's also the, um, I guess, the, the power dynamic within the classroom to think about. Um, and that's something that I guess um, I just wanted to, to ask um, you both um if you don't think more to say about about that kind of um about how we we go about approaching that as as educators i know do you know you're within education and hopefully you've obviously had had an experience here as a student so i thought um just in terms of what, what we might do to sort of address that power dynamic or to to be aware of it within our own classroom spaces um that that's something that you could speak to a bit more um How 
Hamza, I saw you were going to come in, so if you would like to, please do. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I think I'm going to take the first question first. Um, I I found that, like, within, um, well, in my time at Queen's, um, there was a lot of question of, you know, well, we've we've done the research, we've we we understand the issues at hand, but but how do we put this into practice? And and um and I think for me personally, first thing I I would say is, um, the work of decolonization, um, again, isn't just about what happens in a classroom, and it isn't about, you know, um putting in a rule that all academics have to um, do things a certain way. And again, um, I find a lot of times when you do put in certain rules and confines in that that sort of sense, um, it does become almost a tick box exercise. Um, And and decolonial work isn't a tick box exercise. It's, it's, um, you know, it's really looking at the way we practice um, our disciplines in our academic spaces and and the structures of those spaces. Um, And so I don't think I have maybe necessarily an answer of how to go about doing this, but uh, what I can say is that I would advise engaging with um, historians in in, in other universities and seeing um, how, how things have been done. There's some fantastic uh, black historians doing amazing work in, in the area of decolonizing history um, specifically. And, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of resources out there. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure that there are many people um, with the expertise in, in how to actually implement this at a um, maybe school-wide level. Um, would be able to help specifically um, looking at um, the discipline. Um, yeah, so uh, just like Hamza, actually, um, I think the first thing is you need to recognize it, that you're trying to decolonize a discipline and not just your engagements with your pedagogy. I mean, it's that too, it's the discipline. And then, of course, it's the context of Northern Ireland. And what that means is extra layers in terms of um, whether it's post-colony or that sort of thing. But in terms of your discipline, I mean, my word, there is so much that's been written around decolonizing history. Really, really beautiful stuff. And um, it's happening in England and Scotland. There's been stuff around it to do with the Cornish, for instance. And then, of course, um, South America. I mean, this is also linked to the earlier comment about um, about public curation. I mean, I was thinking, I don't know if you've looked at the idea of decolonial thesis with Rolando Vasquez and Mignolo, who do the decolonial summer school. But decolonizing history is really, it is really difficult because of the constructions around it. It's also fascinating. So, even just first engaging with what others have written about and and collaborating with them. I mean, we're, many of us are, are researchers and as we learn about something, you treat it as a project, right? You explore. You don't have a tick box when you're doing a project where you're going into unknown, difficult terrain. You collaborate with those who may know more than you. Um, very possibly, as particularly if it's going to be around um, decoloniality, you try to challenge some of those lines that are drawn, those boundaries between the elitist notion of the institution or what is academic or academia and the rest of the world and how knowledge is and history is constructed. So collaborations with people from other universities, from outside of universities. And then, yes, also, um, like Naim was saying, about trying to to do some work in um, bridging the power the postman bridging the power relations between yourself as a teacher in this position of export authority and your students. Um, However, you've got to be careful because you can land up doing the same processes of extraction um, 
where you you have your students do your hard work for you and have to have to sort of perform um, the the stuff that they've gone through or perform the costs of being in the space or or even be the resources of your teaching you've got to be very careful that it's it's not extractive um, and then of course we can do all of that but then if we're asking for an essay where we're going to assess them or asking them to pay something then some of that form around our teaching it, it becomes disingenuous you know so quite quickly that stuff that we do in the micro curriculum we have to start fighting against that stuff. Um, so Sean, I mean, I would suggest to try some different ways, but also to to do it properly, to to research what you're doing, to be logging it and critically assessing it and holding yourselves accountable even when you're going into uncharted terrain. That seems the most productive because if you do actually manage to come to something, well, then you can share it because this is certainly a conversation that's happening all over the world. Okay, um, I think I think we're coming to an end. Thank you for the that, those excellent talks um, that gave us a lot of food for thought. And I'd like everybody to unmute their microphone and give a, a real clap um, to um, uh, Hamza and Dina. I'm not very fond of these emojis of. Um, <laughs> Emoji claps are uh, for the old fashioned way. Okay, Hello. thank you. Great. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Neem. Do you have anything to add about the next seminar or anybody else? Or? Um, uh, hey, so Barry just had to pop off there quickly. Um, just on behalf of the organizing committee, I just want to thank once again Hansa, Dina, and Dashok for their contributions uh, on this really vital issue. Um, and like a lot of uh, questioners in this session. I hope that this is the beginning of a process of, of meaningful change and reflection in our approach to the issue of decolonization at Queen's. And I want to thank Neve and the Centre for Public History for organising and setting up this event. Uh, next week we have a paper from Dr Jack Doyle entitled A Friend of Tommy's Reading Gay Desire and Homophobia in First World War British Military Justice Systems. Um, if you're interested in attending this sure to be fascinating event, uh, could I ask you to like this week please email us at haphistoryseminars2020 at gmail.com before 4 p.m. on Thursday. Um, and just to remind you, we can only take signups uh, for a week in, for a seminar for a week in advance. So yeah, thanks everyone once again for attending and I hope you have a great week.